Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Ari Cohen Wade, and my guest today is Eve Fairbanks. Eve, could you introduce yourself? Um, yeah, hi, Aria. I'm Eve. Um, I live in South Africa. Uh, I write kind of magazine style pieces, often on, I guess, like the intersection between politics and, and people's lives, like their emotional lives and stuff. And I I've written quite a bit about South Africa. I used to work at the New Republic. Um, I was a staff writer there in the late 2000s. So, so yeah, so um, Blogging Head's veteran, veteran viewers might remember you from, you know, 10 or so years ago, appearing on the site talking about <laughs> politics. Um, and uh, so thank you for coming back on the site. Um, thank you for being, I think, the first person from the Southern Hemisphere to come on this particular um, podcast on, uh, on the site. And um, we are here to talk about an article that you wrote recently that ran in The Guardian. Um, the headline is, We Believed We Could Remake Ourselves Any Way We Liked, How the 1990s Shaped Me Too. Uh, we'll include the link to the article below. I thought it was really interesting. Um, so I wanted to ask you on to discuss it. Uh, so what, what was the like, impetus for writing this piece? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, it was a kind of interesting piece. I wrote it uh, just for myself. So I wrote it as a draft. I just wrote it in an, by hand, actually, um, before I pitched it or anything. And then, I, and then I, I tried to see if people would be interested in it. And I guess the impetus was um, thinking about some of the kind of back and forth that had happened that seemed to me a little bit generational, um, at some, at times around me too. So, um, a number of the people, the friends of mine and the commentators that I read and the people who were really kind of fired up about sexual harassment in the workplace and, um, and a whole kind of range of behaviors, including, I mean, I was quite struck by the Aziz Ansari story. Mm -hmm. And while I thought that it had had some journalistic flaws. I thought it was really, really tough and interesting. And I was, you know, I was glad that I got a chance to read it, even if it wasn't necessarily fair, because I recognized myself in it. Um, in this way, in the sense that, you know, I've been on this podcast before talking about politics. I used to work, I had a little cubicle in the press room in Capitol Hill. My mother had wanted to be a writer, but she didn't have those opportunities. She was a homemaker. Like I live, you know, so much of a bigger life one could say than she did. And yet I'm struck a lot when it comes to love and sex and relationships um, by the kind of timidity of, of some in my generation. But I don't say that pejoratively. I just, it was just an observation. So you then have this kind of episode where someone is just acting in a way, Aziz, I'm sorry, that, that, this woman just didn't want it all. And yet it, it took her, it did take her quite a long time to, um, to extract herself from the situation, to make that verbally clear, to say all these things that, you know, are supposed to be kind of easy to say. Um, once one learns it, no, you know, I want this. I don't want that. I need to leave. And, um, that in particular seemed to just spark, I guess you could say a backlash or a kind of wave of commentary from like Katie Royf and Margaret Atwood and Caitlin Flanagan. I will say, you know, women of, of, of a bit of an older generation saying, you know, what's wrong with, what was wrong with that woman? And what, what's wrong with some of these women who are now kind of bitching and moaning about <laughs> bad dates, about, you know, a little leer in the office. How come, how come they don't seem to have any power when they were supposed to be the most powerful generation? And that just triggered some thoughts for me about power <laughs> and about kind of the paradoxical nature of it and thoughts that I had had prior to that about um, kind of the burden of having been told that I had almost infinite power and opportunity. And I talk in the piece and we can talk about this later about 
I don't think it was just women, but about the 90s as an era that really pushed that message a lot and, and had such a particular, I think it was such a formative era that's kind of not talked about enough in my view. Um, and, uh, and, and the fear of making a mistake and just, I guess I wanted to kind of defend the woman in the Aziz Ansari story. Cause I, she, you know, I've had experiences like that. And I've also had questions asked to me by my own parents when I've told them about a sexual assault. Um, I told my mother about a sexual assault and she, she really seemed baffled. And she just asked me, how did you get yourself in that situation? How did you not extricate yourself? How come you didn't say no? And I felt like this was a really big question, at least for me, that I didn't know that I had the answer, but I wanted to kind of work through that question. Why, why didn't we? And without saying, oh, there's something wrong, you know, that, that it's wrong that we're feeling bad now about these experiences or are angry about them, but to, to wonder about that question without judgment and wonder about, you know, the formation of the character of these women who are now kind of realizing the gravity of a lot that they let pass. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's, there's a lot there. Um, and we'll try to <laughs> unpack it in the time we have yeah, here. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah. And like I said, I encourage everyone to read this essay. It's kind of, it made me think of like, uh, you know, the, the, it's an essay in like uh, the Montaigne sense of like, you're you're trying to figure things out. You're attempting to make sense of the world, and you're not coming up with like a cheap answer or policy position in the end, telling us how to how to fix the problem. But you're you're like thinking very intensely about it and explicating the problem in, in a really interesting way. Um, so wh why don't we talk first about? Uh, the I will say it went through like a hundred drafts, and probably oh, wow. there's four times the material that I threw out. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird one. Um, let's talk about uh, the 90s. Um, so you and I were both born in 1983, and I should say, uh, for the record, we knew each other very uh, vaguely in college. Um, and so I, you know, you gave a very interesting perspective on growing up as a girl in the late 80s and through the 90s. I had the experience of growing up as a boy uh, through that same era, but uh, it was a, definitely a, dif a different experience. Um, and you, you, you just referred to it as kind of a forgotten period. And, you know, there was this idea, the Francis Fukuyama idea that we had reached the end of history. There wasn't really, you know, between the fall of the Berlin wall and nine 11, there wasn't really like a earth shattering, um, event that like defined, defined our age. It was kind of like, uh, you know, some weird mm -hmm. stuff happened and we kind of floated, floated along, like looking <laughs> back on it. And you, right. so you, and you mentioned some of these, uh, some of these events that were not earth shaking, but still like had an effect on young psyches. Um, uh, two in particular were um, the Anita Hill hearings and uh, the Lorena Bobbitt case. Um so I hope we can just like discuss those a little bit. And also I want to, I, you did not, one thing you did not mention in the piece and I want to ask you why was uh, the Lewinsky scandal, which was another thing, mm. another way that our, our generation <laughs> experienced learning about, learning about sex. And, you know, there was much, much ado about it at the time, even though it looks pretty ridiculous in hindsight. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't have a, I don't know, there's no question there, but we'll, can you talk a little bit about the, that part of it of growing up, uh, in this era and like what we learned about sex and gender relations and, and, and then these events, these news events that we were uh, exposed to as well. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and interrupt me at any point. I don't want to kind of, uh, cause I did a lot of reading about this. I was really, really interested to go back. And now that you mention it, um, there was one, one thing that I read, um, I was working on a different essay that hasn't come out yet, but it was on trust, political trust. And I, I was looking at um, trust in government uh, in ever since that's been kind of polled, I guess, which uh, in, in the U.S., which has really been since the 50s. And um, it really tanked during the Vietnam and Watergate, which is not that surprising. But there was another period where it totally cratered almost like it dropped 
the same number of points, it dropped like 30 points, you know, going from 60% to 30%. Um, that was really surprising to me, which was 1991-92. And I still don't feel like I totally have the answer to that, but that was like this little mystery to me. And it just, I kind of set it aside, but I, I remember thinking, you know, we technically we won a war, like Bush won wasn't the most inspiring president. But again, as you say, it wasn't that anything clearly happened. And I had two thoughts. I mean, I think something did happen, which was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the loss of um, of an enemy for the United States. Mm-hmm. So this this is an analogy that I haven't really written about because I I think it. It, it could be taken too far, but I've lived in South Africa now for nine years and something really profound that happened in South Africa after 1994, after the end of white rule was a rise, a, a, a tremendous rise in black anxiety for this reason that um, the sort of narrative, which is was not really true in South Africa's case, because it still has a lot of economic and racial inequality, and it's not like left its history behind. But the narrative had been like, okay, we can't blame whites for our issues anymore. And suddenly black South Africans had to take a look at dysfunction in their society um, and say, wow, okay, we have... Um, we have an AIDS crisis, which which some analysts are saying is driven by certain types of um, sexual habits, and you can say that those have their own history. But but that was within the black community. Um, crime within within black South African neighborhoods. Uh, South Africa has a very high um, incidence of rape and domestic violence um, a- across the board, but it's 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 very prevalent and. And you just had a real unhappiness that that some people developed after, you know, in this period that they were supposed to, like, be triumphant. And it made me think about my own parents who were very involved in the Cold War. Um, My father worked for Reagan. My parents were and are conservatives um, politically. And I remember being kind of bewildered by how... um, how horrible they see the, they seem to take the nineties, you know, and, and I thought, well, Cold War has been won, but they became, they became for time real conspiracy theorists about Bill Clinton. Huh. It's probably why I did get into Monica Lewinsky in the piece, because that has a lot of personal bag. That's like a whole other thing. I mean that, you know, but they, um, they believed, at least my mother believed that, um, that, that Bill Clinton murdered Vince Foster. Um, and they had a real sense. I mean, I remember just a sense of terror, a fear of decline, um, a sense, the decline of the West was like a, I know that's a new Jonah Goldberg book, but that is not a new idea. It was like a constant dinner table conversation, <laughs> you know, dinner, dinner conversation. So that kind of, it was weird because I felt like I had this bipolar childhood because it cut against this sense of new freedoms. Um, I had a lot more freedom. I remember being very struck by the freedom of clothing that I was able to wear when I looked at old photographs of my mother. You know, she was always in little dresses and, and I really liked cargo pants. I had little army uniforms. I really liked soldier, toy soldiers. <laughs> I mean, I could just, you know, I, I went to a math a magnet high school, which I believe had parody, gender parody. Um, uh, math and science and everyone was into computers and geeky and we all coded. Uh, I did not very well, but you know, <laughs> and so, and the internet was like, I, I, uh, I used AOL online and I, I met a man in a chat room who was in his fifties that my parents let me go meet alone when I was 14. Good Lord. So this was like <laughs> pre you know? So it was like, you know, on the one hand, it was this age of innocence, and yet a terrible anxiety. And I think it wasn't just my parents. You know, there was Oklahoma City. Um, I look back at old news programs um, and uh, see a lot of actually white nationalists being interviewed, even prior to Tim- Timothy Fay, a lot about abductions, 
you know, the stranger abduction of strange, stranger abducting your kid. Yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely a big theme. Yeah. Uh, And just in the sense of my childhood too, that like stranger (laughs) danger. I I mean, this started more a little bit before this is more like early eighties when that um, child, um, Aton Pats was abducted off the street in New York city, what became the most famous instance of this. But then, yeah, it was like, you know, there was, yeah, a lot of, there was a lot of, even though the world was at peace and we didn't have to fear a nuclear strike, there was a lot of ambient fear. Like on Halloween, there might be poison candy. Uh, you know, the, the Columbine school shooting happened in 96 or 97 or so. And that was, so suddenly we had to fear, um, you know, something that kind of did come true. Like every, uh, every year there's like a couple mass school shootings. Um, but yeah, and then the, you know, yeah. the uh, internet and cyber predators, um, we don't really hear about cyber predators that much anymore, I guess, because everyone's online. Um, so every predator is, it can be a cyber predator if, if he or she wants to be. Uh, but yeah, there always there was this uh, sense of things to be, yeah, things to be afraid of. Um, but you also you pair that with the like sense of possibility, especially for uh, girls and uh, young women, of being like the the first generation who can like not not exactly have it all, but but. Um, are like equal to equal to men and are empowered enough to, to yeah. not like face the face difficulties. Like that's, that's the story that, that you were told as, as a youth. Yeah. So my, I was going through my dad's old stuff and I found an op-ed that he clipped from the New York times in 19, I believe 1992. That's that was basically finally we're here. Women can have it all. Like, and it said, oh, now a woman can choose, she can run her own business, she can be a CEO, she can be a lady boss, she can be badass, or she can marry, or have kids, or do everything all at once. And uh, and that was really, um, that was, and I think of like movies like um, How Stella Got Her Groove Back, which um, kind of had these women who, almost had it all, but they didn't have a great man. And then the man was like the final piece of the picture, (laughs) but the woman had the BMW and the fabulous career and this kind of fling in Jamaica. And, uh, (laughs) and, um, and there's there's also, um, there's also Murphy Brown, um, having, you know, being a like working single mom. And that was famously, uh, you know, Dan Quayle famously, uh, said that wasn't a good model, but kind of the backlash to that, kind of broke down some of the stigma that had always attached to a woman having uh, a woman having a child out out of wedlock. So I remembered, I mean, I, I remembered the nineties as a bit more when I went into writing the piece, I thought it was going to be kind of how we were totally fed this message of um, kind of infinite possibility for women. So I thought I remember very strongly the Sweet Valley High, which I'm sure you did not read, but that no, was like I, I didn't read super, <laughs> super popular for it was kind of the Nancy Drew, one of the Nancy Drews of, of for my generation. They had 30 books. I read them all. <laughs> um, and the the heroine was this young cub reporter for her school newspaper and kind of like this investigator, Nancy Drew style. But but the Nancy Drew, in my recollection, was a bit awkward socially. You know, her sort of her 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 pursuit of these other these more maybe male paths was almost partly due to necessity. Whereas the heroine of Sweet Valley High was like Jessica Simpson hot, Britney <laughs> Spears hot. I mean, she was described very pornographically. It was a bit you know, because I, I went and reread that. And, but when I went back and looked at, I I watched a bunch of old Oprah shows and I read some old newspapers and stuff from the nineties. My father kept a lot of clippings, which was kind of a fun archive. I was just really struck by the mixed messages and the dark messages. Um, I said in the piece that um, when Fergie, the Duchess of York got divorced, she was so shamed Um, The degree of shaming of Diana, you know, now we kind of think in a way, I think that we loved her, but, but like the, the, and the, I remember that there was something that I read about her that um, she had a nice side and an evil side and you couldn't tell which was which, but both were related to the fact of her being a woman. 
Um, I remember, yeah, as you mentioned, Lorena Bobbitt was like just a huge gossip thing. She was the abused woman who um, wounded her husband's penis. But I remember at the time, every, the, I barely remembered that she'd been abused. My memory of her was that we kind of perceived her as this freak witch who kind of, who was literally castrating. And it, it does um, prefigure some like anxieties that exist now in terms of like incels or whatever, or some of this kind of masculine anxieties that we feel we're just discovering now. This was, I mean, it, America was obsessed with the, the cast, castrating female um, in that yeah. show. And we used to, we used to use her name like to go bob it or to pull a bob it was to like, go nuts on somebody to freak out irrationally and, and weirdly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, until, yeah. until you said that just now, I honestly had forgotten that she was abused and that's why she attacked yeah. her husband. Um, but yeah, it like, was terribly, <laughs> it was like a weirdly, we were pretty little kids when that happened. It was like a weirdly large, it like loomed large somehow. Like the kids heard about it somehow from the news that or their parents. And then it was like the penis got cut off. And then she threw it in a field yeah. or something like she threw it in the cornrows. And that was just like so vivid in our, in at least my imagination of like the penis being like thrown and then like landing in the field. And yeah, I just, mm. we were talking, we would talk about it a lot, wow. <laughs> even though we had this vague, yeah. only vague sense of what it was, what it was really about. It was, it was so like psychologically powerful, uh, you know, for obvious yeah. reasons, like the idea of castration, you know, it's a psychologically powerful idea. I don't know if you used, did you do a, did you go to public school or were you at a, at a private school? It doesn't really matter. I went to a public school. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I remember that we used gay as to like, as it was the insult. <laughs> so in a way, like there's this memory of the nineties as kind of almost, I think a, a kind of screen door that we burst through, you know, but like, everything was so gay if it was bad. I mean, right. we totally, you know, I, I used that all the time in high school. I, did, I didn't really, I didn't give it a second thought. Um, I'm curious. And then I'll, I'll say like how it affects girls. We can go on, but did you feel, um, were you aware as a teenager um, in the nineties of being kind of heavily tested or kind of a pressure, a pressure towards, perfection and achievement that that you kind of noticed i mean does that sort of ring accurate yeah. so to the you, 90s you, you mentioned it in the piece and you mentioned in particular like 17 magazine like quizzes um which which i you know there was no like boys version of that of that kind of thing um i mean we definitely had you know uh, like standardized testing in school really became a thing in the 90s and every year, so it wasn't like as huge a thing as, as it became after No Child Left Behind, but you know, every year we were preparing for the test and then like you would sit for two days in class and take the test and the, t and the teacher always made out, you know, it, we, it was this weird sense of like, this test really is really, really important, but it doesn't matter at all because there was no like, uh, it, it was just like an assessment <laughs> of the, uh, you know, entire grade. Right. It, it wasn't like you needed to get, get like a passing, uh, a, a passing grade to to do it. So, so, so there was that. And then you, you had like the, the thing you mentioned, oh, the, the purity test, which I, I had forgotten about. So I'm glad you, yeah. you uh, dug that out of the internet seller, um, which was <laughs> a very early online test of basic for like teenagers, basically what sexual things have you done? And, you know, go from like going from mild things, like have you ever kissed someone else to like, essentially have you ever raped someone? And you point out that uh, it was very unclear whether you wanted to be pure or you wanted to be impure and whether like the a score showing you're impure meant that you were like super cool or whether it meant you were like a degenerate and uh, or if you are pure and innocent like I was as, as, as a teenager, um, <laughs> whether that meant you were like a total dork, uh, not, not, not a vessel of purity. Yeah, my dad said something interesting when I was in a teenager and he said, and I don't, I'm not going to, I don't take um, either credit or blame for this, uh, this observation if it seems wrong to people. But 
he he said that it struck him because he he sort of studies history as the as the era um like the first era in maybe western modern western human history where public morality was um more loose than private. In other words, that people would kind of talk about things. Certainly in high school, you know, we'd talk about a lot of types of sexual activities and in order to be kind of cool um, that we never had done. And probably I was quite fearful of. Um, and I think that that partly that laid a little bit of a trap Um in terms of like later me almost it wasn't that I lied but that I kind of celebrated um in the 90s as you say the purity test which I really recommend people go back and look at because you will be totally shocked <laughs> even if if you grew up in the 90s it will first of all be a be a trip nostalgia trip but um there's a lot on there that you're asked to confess to whether you did that is assault abuse rape um, really, really bad. Uh, you know, like having sex with someone while you know they're asleep, drugging someone. And it it's all totally folded into things like, you know, have you done graffiti or have you like, you know, that sort of it's it's really unclear where where good and bad ends. And I guess my theory, which was pretty kind of tough to explain in a in a five thousand word piece, but was that um, there was so much pressure to achieve in different ways. And we were rated in, I mean, the 90s was really big on personality tests. It was the beginning. I did the Myers-Briggs personality test in school several times as part of my English class hmm, in high school. Um, it was weird. It was really weird. Um, but we were really into categorizing. I don't know if you remember, I had an AOL account and it, it was just constant passing around of like quizzes where you would answer things from your favorite color to like your hair, you know, who your heroine would be to like, have you raped somebody, you know, all this type of stuff. But, um, but kind of trying to define yourself, trying to, trying to be ideal to you. <laughs> so there was also in that, in that, in the nineties, the kind of gospel of personal authenticity, but I write in the piece that that itself became um, an extraordinary burden and a kind of locus of pressure that it was, it's not easy to be yourself <laughs> and be the best and be the best version of yourself. Who are we? Like we're changing all the time. We're totally influenced. I mean, and so um, I had a lot of stress about that. And I remember, um, and, and so there was a kind of both terror of, messing up, including sexually. Um, my night, my worst nightmares in college were of becoming pregnant. Um, and having, and it was, it's so sad to recall. I mean, it makes me a little embarrassed, but they were of becoming pregnant and having to tell my mom, hmm. <laughs> which shows, you know, that I, I just, that I, I'd, I'd screwed it up in that way. And, you know, I think my parents put a, a, a pretty heavy level of of pressure on me, but I was a public school kid. I think a lot of other people grew up in that milieu. And so kind of desperately wanting to be, be the, be your best self, be the best version of you succeed because you have, you have every chance. Now there's nothing in the way. There's no threat of Soviet nukes. There's no, there's no, um, you know, old fashioned mores. There's nothing holding you back, especially for women. So a terrible fear of taking a wrong step, paired with just a desperate yearning to kind of just get screw up. <laughs> and I think I did some things later in my twenties. Um, I kind of accommodated sexual situations that I really wasn't comfortable with in part because I just didn't want to be good all the time. <sighs> mm -hmm. I didn't want to be perfect all the time. I didn't want to worry so much. I, you know, you wanted to go out and have a drink and get laid or something, right? Even though another part of me felt that wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I, re I remember sex ed being taught sex ed by older teachers, and I felt that they didn't know what to do. Because on the one hand, 
they couldn't really get, give us any positive norms about sex because I think they felt that those were not going to be applicable to us. You know, like you should have sex with this kind of person or you should be waiting. But they had a job. So the job became to terrify us completely. <laughs> I don't know if you recall that sex was totally feathered in with drug awareness as if sex and drugs were the same type of risk and bad kind of dangerous edgy thing um were, were your sex ed, mine, which I, were your sex ed classes taught by gym teachers they were taught by driving teachers and they were taught i i this i might be making this up but i remember <laughs> them as mustachioed men that were very awkward <laughs> yeah ours and so yeah ours were always taught by the gym teachers and we all know the stereotypes about gym teachers and yeah, yeah. it was it was we learned like the female and male reproductive systems you know, we watched, I remember we, you know, like we were watching like drug scare videos. Like, I don't know if we actually watched the one where the girl takes um, angel dust and jumps out the window, but it was that, it was that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very I'm fear based. I'm sure you watched the one where sperm goes to the egg. I think actually, well, there, my class, I, I remember specifically <laughs> that my class was so poorly behaved that they didn't show us the miracle of life <laughs> video where you see the baby oh. being born. <laughs> So I never, I missed out on that because <laughs> the class was talking too much or something. Um, yeah. But one other thing that I, that I remember, I can't, I'm not sure if you mentioned in the piece or maybe just in passing, but um, uh, the AIDS crisis. So, you know, we, we came yes. of age around the time that AIDS stopped being like a death sentence, but it was still like a big fear thing. So, so you said your big fear in college is getting pregnant. Like probably if I was after, um, sex ed at age 13, my big fear would have been getting AIDS. Um, and huh. they made it seem like it was you know, very easy to get AIDS. And they sh I remember very vividly watching this um, kind of a made for TV movie type thing about a, a teenager who um, got AIDS through a blood transfusion. And I think it was called daredevil. Does this ring a bell? <laughs> I watched that. Okay. Yeah. And like that, it was so terrifying. Yeah. So that like, you know, scared the shit out of you. And it's like, uh, you know, like, you know, it created these ideas that, like, I would see some blood on a chair, and then, like, I would have to decide what to do about that blood, you know, it, so there was a lot, it created a lot of, a lot of fear, but then also, um, you know, as we reached, like, late teenagerhood, uh, AIDS kind of stopped being something, like I said, a death sentence, and being, more, you know, being more like something that was very bad, but it didn't mean <laughs> that your life was gonna literally end, so, so that, like that, 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 I totally the fear remember that. The fear aspect and I, season. yeah, I, I remember how many times they told us that the science had, the science seemed to have concluded that you couldn't get AIDS by being sneezed on or kissing somebody. <laughs> but the the number of times they told us that, and like somehow, I became afraid. And and I said in the piece that I think maybe that a friend of mine who went to a public high school, her high school as part of sex ed, uh, brought in people dying of AIDS. Wow. To scare the shit out of them. So sex ed was so weird because it was not about sex. It was about like genitalia and, and the reproductive tract, but it, it had absolutely, you know, it gave you no sense of sex except that like Something really bad could happen, but I really don't, I'm not sure. And then, but then you kind of had this distrust because it's this, this previous generation that seems so separate from you, especially as a woman. Um, my mother told me recently, she said, uh, we were, I was asking her, you know, why she never talked to me about sex. And then I was like, okay, that's awkward. But why did, you know, about love or, and she just said, I just thought you were going to have such a different life for me that I couldn't fathom it. But when I look back on it, I think you were raised by wolves. <laughs> like, and so then we were kind of released into adulthood. And my favorite TV show, I don't know if you ever watched Dawson's Creek. No, like, you know, I yeah. never did. I never did watch that one. Yeah, it was, I loved it. And the heroine, because the heroine was a bit kind of a nerdy woman who was also tomboyish. This is the Katie Holmes and, character. Uh, yeah. And it's so interesting to watch it now because she, or I found it interesting. She has this kind of dual personality that she's really 
really sassy with men. She puts them down in school. She has this science partner she's constantly making fun of, who's a boy, um, for being an idiot. So she's very kind of tart and sassy and kind of hot, kind of bossy in a not a bad way. Um, and she says somebody once asks asks her like if she's a virgin, and she says, "Oh God, you know, years ago I was a trucker on the side of the road named Bubba." And and that was supposed to be the cool response, right? That I got like picked up in like uh-huh. A. <laughs> but then, you know, when she develops a crush on her best friend, you know, it's it's a torment. She can never admit it to him. Never. So she has this mix of like that that I I find is part of the backdrop to me too, which is a kind of overt feeling like you got to be cool with everything and kind of sassiness. But behind it is, uh, I, I mean, this is such a modern phrase, like a, a real terror of vulnerability or um, I recount in the piece what could be considered. I mean, I, I never thought of it this way, but a, a kind of a sexual assault that, that happened to me relatively recently in 2014. And I just remember thinking two things that, that by the time the guy had gotten back to my Airbnb, I was traveling. I had made so many choices that in order to say no at that point, I would have to admit to myself that I'd made a misjudgment and that I'd screwed up. I had to, I would have to change course. I think people underestimate really how difficult that is um, in the moment Mm -hmm. and to kind of come to and then acknowledge and act act on a realization that you had it wrong, that you, and I think, um, you know, for me growing up taught to trust, trust myself and everything. And that I was, I was so kind of this new generation of women who, who had good judgments, like to realize like, holy crap, like I just, I, I got myself into a situation that's really bad, um, was really difficult. And, uh, so I just didn't have the words. They couldn't enter, like they couldn't really enter my mouth. And actually also, um, I would say for much of my teens and my twenties, uh, my romantic life was extremely far from what I would have liked it to have been because it was so difficult for me. I, I had so much worry. A friend of mine put it to me um, that we walked this terribly fine line between being a prude and being a slut and that you were always assessing yourself. It was always coming back to this self-assessment which is a narcissism, but that was the decade. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I making a mistake? Am I doing the cool thing? Am I doing the, the, the thing, the, the good judgment, but then sometimes it's good to have bad judgment because you're disruptive and you're, you know, um, you're just constantly assessing your choices between these binaries that led me to almost, if I think back to some of my boyfriends in my early twenties, I had no idea who they were. Mm-hmm. Like, because, but I also never told them who I was and I never made any demands. Um, I had two boyfriends basically move to other cities and dump me. And they were like, oh, I thought that you would just move with me. And I, and I had to be like, well, that's shameful that you just thought that. Mm-hmm. But, but, but on the other hand, I had never, you know, they had gone through these application processes and I'd never really had the courage to say, uh, look, you're very important to me, but I have a, I have a need in this relationship and it has to be met in this way. Um, I'm not saying that all women were like that. Um, I think, you know, there's a whole spectrum, but I, I think my sense is talking to people like there's a lot of that feeling that, that you let a lot go in retrospect um, that you shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I want to talk more about the uh, sexual experience that you had in uh, Montevideo, which is one of the most powerful parts of your essay. 
Um, and uh, but I just want to briefly mention one other moment from 90s sex education that popped into my mind I hadn't thought about in years, which was this actually happened in my through my uh, Hebrew school, not not through public school. So we were probably 12 or 13 and they brought us into like a large room and they had we were sitting on chairs in a circle and they had like a motivational speaker type person come in. And he started, you know, he was talking a little bit, doing an intro, and then he's like, you know what, I want everyone to give me a high five. So everyone, like, put this art, put their hand out, and he went around the room and gave everyone a high five. And once he was finished, he said, well, you know what, you just high five someone who has AIDS. Um, so you know, all the kids were, like, shocked, <laughs> shocked, shocked by this. And, and then he, you know, talked more about his life, and I don't, really, I don't really remember more than that. But the thing that I do remember is that I was telling this to one of my friends the next day in regular school, and he said... Oh, I would have been so mad. What if he had had an open sore on his hand? So that so that was like yeah. the, the level of paranoia that they inserted into us that like open sore to open sore high five contact with someone who has AIDS, like you're going to get AIDS and you're going to die. Um, so yeah, so there, there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of um, yeah craziness that they that adults and I guess the connection us that with. I made yeah the sort of connection that I made as a woman to me too was um, with that was like, I was just so terrified of sex that I didn't, I didn't have space to really think about it as pleasurable. And then to think about like, okay, well, who would I like to, you know, like if you go on a vacation, like a long weekend with somebody, or if you're going to go out to dinner, like you think about like, who might I like to have? have supper with right (laughs) like who am I going to enjoy this experience with I want to go to a a bar quiz like who's gonna suck at that and who's not like I didn't have I couldn't really think about about that because I had no I had no deep sense that sex could be fun I mean there was a little bit of that messaging out there but it was so heavily overweighed by by this fear did you did you think that it should be fun for the man but not for you or that it wouldn't really yes. be fun for anyone. Okay. I thought it would be fun for the guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And so that, that's like a tr- very traditional idea, I suppose. And what you, said yeah. about, what you said about the prude versus the slut is like the Madonna whore, you know, classic archetype. But like, it's even worse because like a, pr- a pr- whereas we like the Madonna, I guess, uh, you know, being a prude is not a, not a good thing. And of course, no one likes, no. you know, yeah. being a slut is a bad thing too. So it's a real like, you're damn both ways uh, thing that <laughs> society set up for, for young women. Um, no, but I want to say actually, and then, and then we'll go to the Uruguay, but I, I want to say like, I was talking with a girlfriend of mine just today about, about how much um, in the nineties, how, how much language was kind of reoriented, but some of the underlying concepts remained the same. So this friend of mine is a feminist activist professional but she talks a lot about the burden that she feels with men that she dates to be the cool girl. Mm-hmm. Um, so to kind of, it, and that has kind of two meanings. The, the cool girl like who plays video games with you and is cool with your guy friends, but also the cool girl who doesn't mind if you go out with your guy friends at any given time, who's going to let you play video games alone, who's going to be cool with you pursuing some job opportunity in some random place where this is not you clearly since you moved to Rochester for your wife, which (laughs) I applaud, but you know, the cool girl. And uh, she had a boyfriend who was a war correspondent who was basically just leaving constantly with 20 minutes notice. And she would then never hear from him. And she had to be cool with that. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, that it's just, it's just being a good girl. Like you're just supposed to be a good girl. It's just has a different language around it. Mm-hmm. But so it's just, not really just, different. Just agreeing with what the guy wants you to do and assenting to all of his Yeah, things. but I, I just think like the idea of being a good girl, which which sort of I think for my generation, that phrase might not have seemed that resonant, because like my mom had to be a good girl growing up, but I didn't have to be a good girl. I could be these other ways. I could be cool. But I've realized recently that so it wasn't you know, the, the, the idea was imported. It was just given a different name in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah, so Madonna whore turns into the slut versus the prude, except that there's no good thing. You have to be somewhere so that 
point in the middle. <laughs> yeah, balanced on a razor razor's edge. I mean, I was thinking, was I told to be a good boy growing up? Um, I was told to be a mensch, which is a, the Yiddish word uh, for man, and yeah. essentially means like be well behaved. Um, so if I was like, you know, going to synagogue or something, <laughs> like I didn't want to go, it would be like, come on, be a mensch, put on your dress shirt and and do it. Um, so that's, that's uh, so there's you know, the gender difference there and the religious cultural difference there as well. But yeah, it's um, I, I don't know what the um, I don't even know what the word is for a Jewish woman to be like, you know, the, the Jewish woman I was version of a say, mix. like, I think there's two sides to that. I mean, there's part of that that I envy because I my parents didn't tell me to be anything. I, I knew that they could be displeased with me, but there was no. There's no word. I mean, there may be in traditional Yiddish, but there would have been no, there was certainly was no word that I know. I'm also Jewish, you know, to be a mensch. They might have, my parents wouldn't have said be a mensch, but I have heard like uh, another Jewish friend of mine said that his, his parents were proud of him. He was a mensch. And my, like, I didn't know what would make my parents proud. I just, I knew what they vaguely were terrified of, which was that I would be an AIDS junkie or <laughs> a slut <laughs> or some kind of failure. Or but you, but you obviously yeah. were, were a good girl because you got into a good university and blah blah blah. So you must have, you know. But you talk in the essay about your, you know, having a sense of anxiety about uh, perfection and a very funny line where you quote your um, childhood diary and you say you want to get better at sledding. Um, and work at that and that, and you are eight years old when you wrote that, um, you know, so you obviously had, you know, whatever that, uh, sense of determination or whatever that, you know, makes you study and do all the other things you need to do to succeed academically. So that, I mean, yeah, I did say, I found these old diaries, which frankly made me pretty sad because I had so much anxiety as a little kid, but I would write that I was nervous about being good enough, but in like every way. So not only my grades, but then I said, um, I, I want a goal. I would say goal, colon, to get better and better at sledding, <laughs> which is <laughs> sledding is not something you get better at. It's fun, right? <laughs> but I think, and and I found actually, I found a, an old box of, of letters that my high school boyfriend wrote me. And I found one that he wrote me at camp where he said, um, I went... Uh, today I climbed a dangerous quarry and I did some graffiti. It was a productive afternoon. <laughs> and I just thought that was so like, we, you know, he, he didn't feel, and this may be sort of, we were at a magnet public high school, but um, he didn't really feel he could relax. Like that every part of you, you know, we did those personality tests that showed every part of your personality. And then you were pushed to kind of get that right get all of it right. And, and, and so sex was one of those things. And I think now moving to the, the episode that happened to me in Montevideo, like I just felt, I felt that I couldn't, that I should get better and better at everything, including love relationships, sex, you know, um, that it's all a kind of ach achievement of some kind. Everything is rated and that doesn't really allow for, uh, and so then when in that episode, it became clear to me that I needed to get away. Another voice was in me, which is that, um, like you don't want to do anything that's going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do anything that's going to be wrong. And it just, well, I mean, we can talk about that experience if you want, and maybe it'll make more sense if we do, but I think... Sure, I as much as you're like, willing to. Yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, it's very vividly... You're, you narrate it very um, vividly and effectively in the piece, and I encourage people to read it. Um, but, yeah, it, I mean, it's... You know, it's somewhere on the... It seemed to me somewhere on the line between, like, bad sex and, coer like, totally coercive sexual assault. Um, so do you want to just right. describe as, as you want the, um, the details of, of this episode? Yeah. One detail that I think is important that, uh, got cut for space is that I had a boyfriend at the time. And I think that partly made me 
feel like I was already, I was already the wrongdoer. Um, so even when the episode became itself sexually coercive, potentially, um, I, had, I already had a sense of guilt. I'd already done something bad. Uh, it was a, a difficult relationship that's, that ended and was nearing its end. But, and so I was like, I was on a reporting trip. I was, uh, feeling very, very, very unhappy and also very unable to say so in the relationship I was in. And, uh, I went to a dinner with some local journalists and a guy really started kind of chatting with me and he seemed very interested in me and very, you know, uh, seductive. And I was just, I was at that moment so relieved that someone had, you know, hadn't was asking me questions about myself and seemed, seemed to find me alluring. And so then he suggested that we go to a bar and at every step I, there was part of me that thought mm, like, this is just, this probably isn't what I should be doing. But, um, I describe in the piece, a description of prodigies, musical prodigies in a book that I read, which I said has felt a little resonant to me with the whole generation. So people that have these great expectations around them and how much you, you can't, this writer about prodigies talks about um, how often they sabotage themselves because of these high expectations or have difficulty saying no to things and so on. Um, so at every, so we went to a bar, then he said, and then it was one of these things where he said, I said, you know, look, I have a boyfriend. I, I don't want to, you know, he said, well, let me just walk you to your Airbnb. Okay. Well, let me just walk you up to the door. Okay, you know, and and I remember thinking, again, I had these warring kind of thoughts. I thought like, um, I remember feeling very powerful actually. And the, the episode up till it didn't made me feel very empowered because I felt I'm doing something for myself. You know, I'm not getting the sex that I want. I'm not getting the respect that I want in my relationship. I'm I'm taking charge as a woman. I'm doing, I'm, of my own pleasure or whatever. And, uh, and I also, I think, I think I just somehow felt that cause didn't have to equal effect. I thought I can always get out of this. You know, I can, I can always, always stop it without thinking how. So then we got inside the Airbnb and the, the guy at that point blocked the door sort of, I mean, he sort of stood in front of the door and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was very, very, very insistent. And because I already felt like a bad person, <laughs> I, um, I think I didn't realize it, but he was very insistent and he, he, he wanted to have sex. And I, I felt that I, I, I felt totally stuck. I really didn't know what to do because um, sort of pushing him, um, um, I don't know. It, you know, there's a lot of context in the piece, but it really felt almost like something like a woman of a previous generation would have done. The fact that I was already that, that I'd already gotten myself into this scenario made me feel guilty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big thing for women is that, you know, the point at which Louis CK shows you his dick, the point at which our, you're in Charlie Rose's hotel room, you already feel guilty about that because you, you feel that you actually should have known better. There's a whole host of reasons why that might have happened and that guilt is often misplaced. But And that leads you to, to have kind of poor judgment. So I felt like I was the one in the wrong and that I would be kind of – I would be all these things which I really associated with Princess Diana. Huh. Hyster hysterical, uh -huh. uh, indecisive. Um, changing my mind, uncertain, uh, shoving somebody. It just seemed like something out of like a, a black and white 1950s movie where a woman's virginity is about to be, you know, like, oh, and then she just has to scream. And, right? and uh -huh. I just. So if it I was just, like a melodramatic feeling in a way? 
There was, and I just think, I mean, it's it's almost hard to hard to remember because I can't justify it, but I do think that I felt terribly guilty. But what I wanted to say is that I felt guilty all the time. Um, <laughs> As as a as an adult woman in my twenties, because I felt I was either, you know, not living up to my potential, or I was being too prudish and straight, or I just or I was doing something wrong because I didn't know what right was. I just I felt really it was a pervasive sense of of, of anxiety and and not trusting myself and guilt. So then <laughs> I had, I I developed, I had two different techniques. It's amazing to me now that I had two ways that I would extricate myself from sex, from uh, being pressured to have sex, neither of which was to say no or to say that I didn't want it. I think because I felt that I was going to make the guy feel bad or I, I was, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when I was a teenager, guys complained constantly about blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> they said, fuck man, you know, my girlfriend's giving me blue balls. I hate that bitch. Like, and yeah. I just thought, oh, she's really bad. Like, that's really wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, blue balls was also a phrase heard often, yeah. um, yeah. in my late and teenage so, years. So I was going to give this man blue balls and that was like a cardinal sin and so I said, um, I said that my vagina was broken, uh, which I, which I used to say, um, and, uh, that it would work usually actually. Um, cause it was, I, I, my other technique in college when I would bring a guy or when a guy would come back to my dorm room, cause I thought that was what you're supposed to do in college. But then I realized, oh my gosh, I don't want to have sex with this man. Uh, I would show him a rubber brain that my dad had once given me as a gag gift. I would say, I really want to show you something. And I showed this brain, it kind of looked like a testicle. It was so weird. It was just so weird. And so I, I was ready to humiliate myself and just come off as a really weird girl in order to, rather than say no, which is amazing. I can't, it's, it's, I still wonder, you know, why was it so hard to just say I, no? Instead, I would make myself seem like a, just a completely baffling, insane person, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, then, yeah. Wait, so, so just to pause, so the brain thing would be like the, the guy would be so freaked out by the fact that you would carry around this like rubber brain that they'd be like, well, actually I have class at 9 a.m. And Yeah. I just think the vibe of the mood would go, you know, the mood would be killed. And then I would be allowing the man a, an honorable exit rather than being rejected. He would have the chance to reject me because I was a weird girl. And I tried in the middle of a hookup to show him a rubber brain <laughs> that you wound it up and it jiggled. <laughs> okay. So, okay. But then I didn't have that in Uruguay. So, I would say, sorry, my vagina is broken. <laughs> Usually people didn't ask for an explanation. But, um, but anyway, this, this, this man, uh, he said, um, no worries. Uh, mine could be the dick that fixes that for you. And I just thought, I felt like I'd been checkmated. That was the feeling. Uh-huh. You know, like... This, 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 this last ditch, humiliate myself technique failed and he, he checkmated it and I didn't know what to do. And I guess, um, I talk in the piece about, and about the feeling of wanting to preserve one's own dignity through preserving one's decisions. So the decisions that I'd already made up to that point, um, many of which I knew were mistakes. Mistakes tend to beget the justification of them and more mistakes, as many generals <laughs> know. You know, you don't. Rather than you make it a mistake, you'll just make another in the same vein. You know, you keep going. So that was sort of, I think, what happened. And so I guess so. 
at the end of the essay, I, I, I guess I felt like I wanted to send a message to to some of the women who I felt had not understood, maybe without fault of their own, but some of these dynamics and say, you know what, like, I felt that, that, that letting that sexual encounter then happen, which I absolutely did not want at that point, was my way of being powerful. Mm-hmm. Was my way to exert my power. Now, that's wrong. That's very messed up. Yeah. But I think it was inculcated by, by, by the, the whole host of, of messages in my upbringing about the, the danger of making mistakes. I mean, we talked about fear. I talked about these Oprah episodes, which actually I wasn't as struck by, but loom very large in some of my girlfriend's imaginations of Polly Class, the girl who was kidnapped from a sleepover mm. in California and murdered, that you can make a very minor, you can just kind of look the wrong way at a guy on the playground and your life is just, and everything is ruined, you know? And um, when you walk around with that feeling that your life is this precious trajectory and that, that, that you're not a person, but you are a promise, right? Mm-hmm. And you, and you, the person is constantly in danger of screwing up, fucking up your promise and your, you, you can't, it's very hard to take bold actions and sex was a very fraught area and it was really hard for me to take, to take certain types of bold actions, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, uh, well, first of all, just thank you. Then, thank you. Thank you for yeah. sharing this you know, very intimate story with the world, because I think it's, it's an important one, um, to get, to get out there. Yeah. Um, did you did you read a cat person that viral New Yorker short story yeah. from last year? Yeah. I mean, so that story reminds me somewhat of of yours, and especially the part where the the young woman wants the sexual encounter to stop, but then if she says stop and he doesn't stop, that means that she's being raped, and that means that she's like a victim of rape, and she doesn't want to think of herself as a victim of rape, so she. You know, and then they would have to, she like, the guy drove her to his house. He would have to, like, you know, drive her home again. That would be super awkward. And so she might as well just, like, let this continue, even though she doesn't want to do it at all. Um, and I think that, you know, that story came along at a time when, a, a couple months after the first um, Me Too stories broke, and it illuminated mm-hmm. something for a lot of people, including me. And I think, uh, you know, there were a lot of women who said that this expressed, um, an uh, emotion that they've never seen uh, expressed before, and yeah, I think you're you're doing something similar with a, a real life experience of yeah, how you know the step step by step how it happened and where you where you ended up. Um, did you so after the Weinstein story broke and this whole cultural change started to come? Did you look back on that episode differently or or not? I remembered it more vividly. I didn't look back on that one that differently. I, I looked back a little differently on one that I mentioned in one sentence in the piece, very in passing, but um, uh, an episode that I that I had with an older, older journalist when I was 21, I was a senior in college, which uh, was more distressing actually in terms of its details. And I remember describing it to a girlfriend of mine, this fem- this, wo- this woman who is a, a feminist activist after me too, it, it really brought those memories up. And she said, you were raped. And I had such an immediate visceral sense of my heart sinking. Mm-hmm. And I just thought of that with cat person because you know, I just sort of described in the piece that we're, we were supposed to be so powerful that that there's still a feeling like you, if you, if you let that happen, then I don't know. I, it was very bodily. It was weird. I mean, because I don't, you know, intellectually I say, you know, every, you know, any rape victim should not be ashamed and, um, absolute, you know, all that, all, all of that. But 
in my heart, like just hearing that, I thought, oh my God, I, I'm a rape victim. Like, and I never thought of myself that way. And that puts me in some category. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what was interesting about, um, about the beginning, about sort of the beginning of me too, was actually, it brought up more memories of relationships that I've had. And some of that was cut out of the piece, but I did describe a relationship that I had with my high school boyfriend, which was not assaulting at all. But um, I started to just almost have like re-traumatized memories of some relationships that I'd been in that were very, um, very difficult relationships. I'm sure they were for the, the, the man, one in particular, um, and uh, in, in my late twenties, an adult relationship that went on for six years and just feeling so angry and so, yeah, that uh, at certain things that I accommodated that were not rape. And that was part of the reason that I wrote the piece because I wanted to at least, almost like incorporate a story that was that many people would might term a kind of assault that happened to me, a sexual assault with um, just dissatisfaction and anger and pain that happened in relationships that were not sexually ass- assaulting. And I think that's what has been really hard for a lot of women is like, having a lot of memories come up of, of things, of things with ex-boyfriends or even things with current partners, just types of situations. And, but then feeling that it's difficult to talk about them because this is supposed to be a conversation about rape and we're supposed to draw, draw these boundaries and we're supposed to make sure that we're not talking about um, things that are not like justiciable so that we don't ruin people's reputation I want, you know, I'd love for more people to talk more anonymously, I guess, as I did, because I think way more of that stuff has to be talked about. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, so, you know, the, the memories that came up for me and the women I know had much more to do with their husbands, mm-hmm. with their, um, with, with work situation, with other, with with intimate relationships that are not like rape and it's not, and not even ones that they want to end or are bad, but are just things like, geez, you know, like this was actually a really painful thing for me to endure. And, and now I'm thinking about it and I'd like to process it. But I guess I feel like that's part of what's been halted a bit by the kind of fixation on making sure that that's not talked about. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the people who have become, um, the, uh, you know, the, the main characters in this drama are the most extreme characters. So Harvey Weinstein, if the accusations against him are true, is a serial rapist and deserves to be in jail for the rest of his life. Uh, Bill Cosby is a serial rapist and deserves to be in jail for the rest of his life. Uh, then you, then you get like down the line and yeah, it's, it's not as bad, but then it's, you get into the, and you also get into the Aziz and Sorry, where it's where the conventional wisdom seemed to land on the fact that like uh, Aziz and Sorry was the real like victim of this experience because mm. he, he's his private life was exposed on Babe.net. Um, but I, it does. It, <laughs> but it, it, see, that's it's sad for me. Yeah, because for me, the Aziz and Sorry piece was the one that got me to thinking by far the hardest, and I think I'm not alone. And it was a kind of cat person in reality. And it was really, really, really real, really blurry. There is no line. And I, I, I feel sorry for his, I, you know, as even said, he kind of, it was like a bit of a hit and run, like, or sort of like collateral damage. Like I, I, I regret, I think, you know, I wish maybe that had been written about anonymously, although it wouldn't have gone viral, I guess, because I don't know that he deserved for his career to like be, ruined or impacted, you know, based on that. And yet it's that type of episode that I want to talk about just as much as people who are compulsive office masturbators, which is probably, probably still a minority. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I think, I think when you categorize, when you sort of try to draw that line, we're, we're, we're abdicating the conversation that, 
that a lot of what women really want to be having. And also men, like I, I note in the piece that I don't believe that this man, Uruguay, necessarily, look, he should have been taught, I don't know that culture that, that you don't push so hard, but I don't know that he had an idea that I was upset because I pushed myself so hard to act kind of cool with it and, oh, and fine. I don't, I don't think he thought that I was, you know, going to move to Uruguay and be his wife. Like we didn't have that evening, but I don't think he knew. And, and I think that's unfair. I'm not saying that I'm the one who perpetrated that injustice. I think it's cultural, but you know, I think, I think that, um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, th I think my sense is that, and maybe I'm wrong and I'd love to hear from you, but that like men are much clearer now on the right things to say and maybe less on the right things to do. Huh. Um, but there's still, there's still maybe a, you're married, but for, for younger men, a, um, an expectation that you're going to be the instigator of an encounter um, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's well, it's obviously super complicated. Um, I think there's, <laughs> there's, there's a negative trend related to online pornography and the way a man should act in an uh, intimate encounter with a woman. Um, I think <laughs> there's, there are people out there who use the, like, you know, they pretend to be woke, but actually they are very unwoke in how they'll treat a woman. And we've seen some of those people, um, uh, you know, people on the left uh, accused or exposed of being, uh, you know, predatory uh, sexually. Um, so, yeah. I, and yeah, I think I've been with the same woman for too for too long to comment much further on the you know, contemporary dating mores. I do like I mean it's such a like cliche, but it's like men do better. Like there has to be some kind of cultural change that happens with how men view women um and how they uh treat women and I have no idea how that could be arrived at. You talk at the end of your piece about positive consent and you're uh you sound skeptical about it. Um I guess uh, I was just skeptical that it's enough, you know? So I, I, one thing I feel is, you know, there are men that I've spoken to who say, I mean, I've had conversations with some men close to about why I've, I've been, I've gotten the sense that they feel awkward. You know, these are men with whom I've had, uh, you know, decades of political conversations, but there's some kind of awkwardness around, me too. Um, and for, for, for a few of these people and they will say, you know, I just, it doesn't resonate for me because either because like I'm married or because I, I just, I just don't think I'm, I, I think I'm a pretty good guy. Mm -hmm. I don't think I did that kind of thing. Like I didn't masturbate into a plant, you know, I didn't like, hump people at water coolers. I want to say to you and also to, to other people that I think it's worth querying, like, and just, you know, not like how good were you, but like, what is a good guy? Right. And like, are we so sure that we know mm -hmm. and are, are people who feel that they don't have to take part in this conversation because they're not um, Harvey Weinstein's like, kind of abdicating a responsibility to just ask themselves like what you know what is my wife potentially you know how is she experiencing this what you know uh, there was a sort of online forum for alumni of my high school as it happens that I was on and I asked I posted a question I, and I said I, I want men any way defined you know if you're if you identify as a man I want you to, to just tell me like why so much silence, guys? And I got a lot of pretty interesting answers. But there was one guy who was like, I've been asking my wife, like, even though she's not volunteering, like how I've been, how she's been feeling about this, whether she had any experiences that she didn't tell me about because she thought it was awkward that she would like to talk about. And 
maybe not, you know, and, and I thought that was so cool. And, and ev- all the other guys were like, what? <laughs> and so, and not, not to blame at all, but you know, I, I think that I just keep hearing like, well, I'm a pretty good guy or the, or, you know, and I just, I'm not, I'm not denying that. I may be saying there is no such category as, as much as there isn't a good girl. I'm not going to say I'm a good girl, you know, <laughs> I'm a good, I'm a good woman. I don't know what that would mean. Right. But yeah. Um, so maybe the good guy thing needs to be <laughs> interrogated a little bit. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I think, <laughs> you know, there's all the, there's like, uh, something called the Good Men Project that attempts to, uh, inculcate, uh, positive values in men. Um, mm-hmm. it's, <laughs> you know, it's clear that men as a gender, like, <laughs> are having a lot of problems um that uh defy easy easy solution um you know the good and is there a good man is there a good woman this is like uh we're getting into like uh philosophical areas here that i'm i'm probably not qualified you're qual- more qualified to comment on the, than i am but um you know probably everyone uh you know every guy thinks of himself as a good guy probably harvey weinstein thought he was a good guy most of the time he probably thought like yeah i have this little problem and you know, but I like if these if these girls just do this with me, like I'll set them up with like a really great career. So you know, like anyone, everyone can justify their bad behavior. Uh, the the brain is great at doing that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's uh, it's on men somehow to uh, rein in behavior, to um, call out behavior that they hear about uh, when it's just just the guys talking and that kind of stuff. Um, mm. But. Uh, maybe maybe there is some kind of cultural change happening. I mean, most of the, well, I don't to overgeneralize. Most of the at least famous offenders that have happened that have come out in in this era are older of an older generation, um, and so part of it like. It, so part of it is like that's an excuse. Like Harvey Weinstein grew up in the, he came of age in the seventies and that was like a rock and good time. And you could just, you know, have sex with a woman no matter what she said. And like, it, it was fine. Yeah. Um, so right. that's, that's obvious bullshit, but um, maybe there has been some generational change. Maybe what all that stuff that our parents and teachers told us in the nineties has had some effects. Like the kids see more woke than the older people. Maybe this is this can Maybe. somehow help. I you don't should know. invite you should invite a young man on the show. I mean, <laughs> I I keep hearing these like unnerving statistics, like you know, a greater percentage of millennial men than Gen X believe that um, that uh, that they really feel it's important for them to make more than their wives. Mm. I don't know, like who, what what these polls are about, really, but I do think. I think certain of these things that seem obvious, but I think they are huge. Um, I will say maybe this is going to be too much information, but I will put it out there as a theory that I have, um, I've had sex with people who are basically above the age of internet porn. Like they wouldn't have really come of age on that Mm -hmm. at all, or really almost seen it. Um, And, and, of that generation. And I've long felt that there's a big difference Hmm. in how men behave sexually. Um, I mean, prior to me too, actually had a sort of theory about this. Like I just have been really struck by it. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, it is a different, it is a different generation, but we also have like, I don't know. I have to avoid like Reddit men going their own way. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the internet has enabled all these negative <laughs> things and people, the yeah. incels, yeah, the men going their own way who are this like male separatist movement, I guess is how to describe it. And it's very anti woman, and a lot Maybe of guys who have like, well, there, it's a lot Probably, of guys who have like yeah. bad divorces yeah. and stuff, and uh, this is their, yeah. you know, their life obsession. And, uh, you know, the alt right is overwhelmingly male. Um, and that, that has, you know, formed itself online. So there's the, the, that maybe the, um, maybe, uh, my optimism was, was misplaced uh, and, and the, and the incel movement is the thing that's going to continue to grow. Um, uh, we've gone, uh, a, a, kind of over an hour, so we should probably wrap up. Is there anything else yeah. you want to say before we close out? 
Um, I don't think so. I mean, just the last thought that I had uh, on um, that sort of bipolarity. I mean, my my dad's pretty conservative, but I, I talked to my parents a lot about kind of changes in values. It's interesting. And I showed him some stuff from like these Reddit, red pill. And I would say that, I mean, on the one hand, he doesn't really, you know, the like his values vis-a-vis women would probably be not as progressive as maybe most millennial men. But he was just like, he was horrified and he was like, what is, I, I don't, like, I grew up, he grew up in the rural South. And he was like, I never think I met any man as odious, <laughs> even, you know, as, as, as this, like, this is just horrible. Uh-huh. So, so maybe there's a bit of a split, but um, I don't know. Yeah. Any, any read, like anybody who watches this and grew up in the nineties, I would encourage you to just go back. Back for fun. It's really fun and interesting. And um, and the historical memory of the decade, maybe like the 50s, um, the way it's sort of set, settled a bit in history is so different from, I think, how we ex- lived it and what was actually in the papers. Mm-hmm. Oh, one final question. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten from readers of, of the piece? I got kind of interesting feedback. I got a, a, some feedback. Um, I would say it wasn't, I didn't get the most feedback I've ever gotten from a piece, but there were a few people who read it who seemed to just really, really, really love it. Um, so some younger women, which was really cool. Um, some older women, which I really liked. Um and what about and, what about those yeah, mi- those middle people born in the early eighties? <laughs> our co our co <laughs> co evils did you hear yeah. from any other nineties yeah. kids? Oddly enough, I sort of got I got more feedback from maybe women in their fifties and then um, some women in their twenties that I was aware of, and then um, I got some feedback from older men uh, who were just like. I think they were maybe more struck by the nineties. They were like, wow. Like I remember one, one man said, you know, that he he was a teenager in the seventies with oil shocks and Vietnam and Watergate and, you know, and he, and then he thought the nineties would just be like easy peasy. And (laughs) you know that, and he, he just, he was interested to read that it, that it wasn't just shapeless or kind of neutral or void or like good basically, you know, but that it had a kind of um, cultural valence and certain type of character to it, which I think it did. Mm-hmm. So that was nice. I like, I mean, that was nice to hear. Um, okay. I think that's all I have. Um, so Eve Fairbanks, thank you Thanks. sincerely for coming on and talking about, uh, your personal life in detail and uh, bringing this very interesting subject to life in your essay. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, so if, so people who are interested in your work can, can go to your website. Yes. It's Eve Fairbanks.com. Yeah. And, and you're also on Twitter. Is it also just Eve Fairbanks? It's Eve Fairbanks on Twitter. Yes. And I actually, write a lot on Facebook so you can always add me as a friend <laughs> I don't tweet very much I find it tough but uh, <laughs> but I put a lot of I put a lot of writing kind of musings and reflections that don't end up in uh, in the newspaper anyway so that's, oh, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting probably. maybe a general, maybe a separate conversation about <laughs> uses of Facebook versus Twitter um, but uh, Eve, uh, yeah. th- thank you again and um, uh, all of our viewers and listeners we'll see you next time thanks Aria